Hi everyone, it's uh, Ricky Spencer and part of our Sociology of Media Voices Media Byte series. I have the pleasure today of welcoming a exciting person with an extraordinary journey to tell us about and that is Wombat Lions. Welcome Wombat Lions. Thanks for having me. Lovely. And I should start by saying that Wombat Lyons and his pronouns are he and him is a qualified youth worker and he is currently a youth services uh, manager at a local high school. He's also a justice of the peace and he has a big role he plays in Scouts Australia. So we're going to hear all about our exciting person wombat wombat tell us a bit about your journey through your life as a youth worker yeah um i was at high school and um they did all those career aptitude tests and they kept asking me uh what did you like doing what were your hobbies and at that time i was a youth member of scouts and so you know i talk about all the stuff i did at scouts um and so the school suggested consider youth work. So I went straight from high school into RMIT's Youth Affairs Program, uh, which doesn't exist anymore, but that used to be out on their Bundura campus. And it was loosely linked to their education program. It was uh, not the great, well, they probably thought it was the greatest program they ever had, but it was not the greatest course they ever had. And clearly they knew that because during our first year, they announced that they were going to create a brand new course, which was the Bachelor of Social Science in Youth Work. And if we would transfer to the city campus, we could go in to that course and pick up this new uh, qualification. So I was very happy to jump across and do that. And that worked out really, really well uh, in that um, RMIT had really invested into making that a very strong course and during that course I had placements at all sorts of interesting places. I remember volunteering at the Don Bosco Youth Centre and um, you could imagine me and the Catholic uh, priests got on really well uh, but we did it, uh, we made it work um, and it was a great facility that they have um, there for young people um, but also in that time I started doing some placements that were linked to schools and I did um, the uh, special Development School in Ascot Vale and uh, Buckley Park Secondary College in Essendon. And that gave me a real taste of what youth workers could bring to a school environment. So when I qualified at that course, during my time at uni, I'd been working with Melbourne City Mission in respite care for young people with disabilities. I'd been working in uh, some of their disability uh, programs and some specialised programs they were doing uh, for what was DHS, uh, now DWFH. Um, and so I sort of kept going with Melbourne City Mission after uni and then stayed in the disability area, went to a company at the time called Roytel, which is now Ability Works Australia, which um, is what's called a business services. Um, but if you're not in the disability sector, you probably don't know what that term means. And a lot of people would call them a supported workshop, but that's not the terminology that we like to use. Um, and so essentially, it's a company that is paid to employ people with disabilities. Um, and uh, they then uh, particularly worked in manufacturing and packing. And they had disability support workers and people like myself supporting the employees to be able to uh, build those workplace skills. And our ultimate aim was that people could leave Roytel and take out um, actual full-time employment in the mainstream workforce. Um, and so that's what we did. And Roytel was a shortening of Royal Talbot and it was on the site of the Royal Talbot Hospital, which is a rehabilitation hospital. So I did that for a while, but in the back of my head was uh, the valuable role that youth workers could play in schools. And so I had applied for um, a youth worker job uh, linked to Darabin Community Health Services but actually based in Northland Secondary College. Now, Northland Secondary College doesn't exist now, and that's why I'm not there still. But at the time I joined there, they're in a transition. So Northland had been shut down by Jeff Kennett. 
It opened again as a rebel school. It had particular links to the local indigenous community. Um, the Koori community didn't really want to uh, move from Northland to uh, some of the other local schools at that time. And so kept fighting for the school to be reopened. It got reopened post Kennett, uh, ran as a secondary school, but you know, the writing was on the wall. It, it, wasn't going to continue as a secondary school. So it actually specialised in a number of programs. And I was there for that transition between being a mainstream secondary school and being what it is now, which is, I think, Northern Academy of Technology and Arts, but I probably have its name wrong. Uh, but essentially it became a trade training centre, uh, a step before TAFE for young people. So it specialised in offering maybe one day a week to kids from other local high schools and when I was there we'd have people coming in from across the north west of Melbourne to study uh, various arts and technology. We also had what was a year 13 program so if you think mm -hmm. mainstream secondary ends at year 12 so year 13 is a bridging year between high school and um, university and that focused in design and it really allowed kids to develop their portfolios so they could enter into fashion and design and art subjects at university, which are pretty hard to get into if you don't have, like it's very hard to go straight from high school into those sort of uni courses. So um, those were the programs running at the time. And as a youth worker on site, it was a really interesting place to work because you had your, you know, five day a week students in year seven, eight and nine. Um, and then you had a small cluster of year 10 students and then you had our specialist BKL programs, our trade training programs and our year 13 programs. So you're working with this huge range of the community. You're working with people you saw five days a week and you're working with people you saw one day a week. Um, and as a youth worker, um, you were always on your toes. So I really enjoyed working at Northland. Um, but you know, with this transition, um, there came a point of time to move on. And I uh, decided to look outside of Melbourne and ended up with Trafalgar High School, which 10 years later, I'm still at. I'm now the manager of uh, the welfare team. We use old fashioned terminology. We're in the country, we're allowed old fashioned terminology. So we call it the welfare team. Um, you know, other schools might call it wellbeing or, you know, something more trendy, but that would involve changing the sign on the door and that's too much work. Uh, so we're the welfare team. We have a school nurse. We have another youth worker with myself. We have a school chaplain um, and we've done our best to manipulate the federal government chaplaincy program to ensure that our chaplain is there for the benefit of young people, not the promotion of any faith. Um, mm -hmm. And we also have um, lots of networks with the community. Um, so through that, I'm very involved with the Trafalgar Youth Resource Centre, which is essentially a community-based um, mentoring program. And for the last 10 years, it's been very uh, focused on the high school age group, uh, possibly because I'm very focused on the high school age group, uh, but we're about to trial a return to working with primary school students. And we've just started advertising our first primary school mentoring program. Um, so yeah, currently there. And then outside of all of that has been my volunteer role with the Scouts. Now this is quite interesting because Scouting and when I grew up was seen primarily as something that uh, young people who love sport or were good at sport, um, who were cisgendered and heterosexual, would be a place for them to meet others and make friends. And for people like myself who identified um, as gender non-conforming or queer, really were frightened or felt we wouldn't be connected. So can you maybe, maybe explain to me whether is that the case these days in scouting? Um, and obviously it isn't, but let explain that how, how scouting now has changed and your role in that bringing um, pride into scouting. I can't claim any role in that. I'm just along for the ride. Um, I joined my local scout group growing up in Glenroy. That was the 10th Glenroy scout group. It's now called First Oak Park um, because 
uh, as communities evolve and change, groups merge together, volunteers are getting harder and harder to find. So anyone watching this who needs a volunteer role, mm -hmm. we'd love you in the Scouts. Um, but, you know, I joined that and I'm a young person, uh, or I was a young person, I'm now well away from being a young person. Um, I was a young person who, you know, is of a culturally diverse background. Um, I, you know, struggled ADHD uh, and autism um, sort of traits, uh, really struggled uh, with some of those things. And Scouts was that avenue to make friendships. And I think that was my observation of scouting in the 90s and still is to this day. Scouts is the place that reflects its local community and any young person in our local community would be warmly welcomed in their local scout group. We have become known for being a place where because we're not about you need a particular skill set or you need a particular ability set, you can come into scouts and you can find success, you can find fun, you can find everything you need. So lots of kids with disabilities particularly join scouts and find what they're looking for because, you know, unlike maybe a sporting based group where you need to be able to perform to a certain skill level, at Scouts, it's all about the individual. So um, everything is, um, you know, individuals set goals, you know, the program is set by the young people in there. So if you've got 20 young people in there, they're the 20 young people who form what's going to happen that term. Um, so I think um, we've become a really inclusive place. We've had um, a lot of success in terms of the gender diversity and um, LGBTIQA plus inclusion. I was a Ventura Scout at Strathmore Ventura Unit and I was there when the Boy Scouts of America, who are now bankrupt, so, you know, mm. let's, let's make fun of them. Uh, when the Boy Scouts of America foolishly announced their uh, ban on queer members. And um, I wrote, I was a venturer, I was only 15 years of age, uh, and I wrote to the Chief Commissioner of Australia. Um, so, you know, pretty bold move there to say, would Australia um, be going in the same direction? Uh, because if it was, it was going to challenge my ability to be a member. Um, and he wrote back, almost, he must have wrote back as soon as he got the letter. Uh, and he said, we're Australia, we don't do what America does. Anyone who can live by the scout law and the scout promise can be a member of scouts. And that's the message that I've always carried in my adult volunteering with scouts. If you can live by our scout law, if you can live by our scout promise, and by our scout promise, we promise to you know, be respectful. We promise to um, uh, engage with our local communities. We promise to, you know, um, be our best selves, our promise is very simple to live by. It's a very simple set of values. Um, but if you can live by that, you can be a member of our movement. And so all young people can be in Scouts. Um, your abilities don't matter because the program will be um, flexible and adapted to reflect local communities. So, um, you know, I was meeting with, uh, I also help at the Cubs which is the uh, seven to 11 year old age group in Newborough, which is a town not far from where I live. Um, and uh, I was meeting with our leadership team today, planning out term activities. They've all been suggestions from the kids. They want to do a camp, so camps on there. They want to do a night where they smash up cakes because you know, that sounds fun. Um, so we've put that into the program. They wanted arts and crafts. So we've done some arts and crafts. We're finishing our outdoor adventure skills in uh, water safety. So we're gonna hopefully find someone in the community who can teach us different ways of rescuing people. And we're gonna make sure given that it's term three, we're gonna make sure we're doing that in the local heated pool uh, mm -hmm. because you know we'd freeze to death up at Blue Rock Lake. Um, but you know, that's what scouting's like. It reflects the local communities. The kids ask what they want to have in their program. But I guess where uh, we have met and uh, had some contact in scouting has been around scouting and I guess it's visibility in the LGBTI QA plus space. Um, and uh, for us, you know, that's really about celebrating sexual and gender diversity. 
So uh, Scouts Victoria, six years of going to Pride March in Melbourne. Um, we, in our first few years, Girl Guides Victoria were not attending. Uh, so we accepted Girl Guides to march with us in the Scouts. Uh, and it's been very lucky in the last couple of years, Girl Guides have actually attended uh, as well, independently of us. And so the two organisations, uh, we tend to march very near each other in the parade. Uh, we're meant to be next to each other this year, but we got a bit confused and confuddled on that oval. And um, we ended up in between some schools. So um, our kids decided to have a chanting match with the kids from another school. Um, which added lots of fun to people on the side of the parade, <laughs> trying to, you know, balance these two groups of kids uh, chanting, competing with each other uh, for the best chance. But, um, you know, that's the fun of Pride March. So we always make sure we go there. And Victoria is not the only state doing this. Um, Scouts New South Wales have been at uh, Mardi Gras a couple of times, obviously a very different environment and not the ability to get in every year. Uh, but when they can get a space at the Mardi Gras Parade, they get a space at the Mardi Gras Parade and take scouting there. Um, I work very closely with the team in South Australia who um, always go to their events. So there's that visibility element. And I guess my next stage as a Scouts Victoria person is going, yep, Pride March Melbourne, we're consistently there. We're going to make sure that's on offer to our members. But what else? Where else can we be? Um, and it's my hope that we might be at Chill Out next year in some capacity. Uh, we're looking at, you know, what can we offer as scouts to these events? Um, you know, it's always sort of been my thing of there's many um, artists and performance groups who are looking for venues uh, for some of these festivals and events. And scouting is usually in every community in some format. Mm. And if we have a scout hall there and they need a venue that can, you know, have a community workshop or a community forum or any other sort of things, like we want to become known that knock on our door, ask us, we'll, we'll be a part of that. So we work with that. But uh, my work in Scouts, Diversity and Inclusion is the title, but it covers so many different areas. So it's around, uh, we make sure that we're supporting our volunteers because our volunteers come from all walks of life. Um, you know, my colleague uh, at Newborough, um, the group leader there, he runs his own business. It's a framing business, you know, he, frames people's paintings and photos. Um, you know, no special skills in working with young people. So, you know, we've offered things to volunteers who come from all these diverse backgrounds, things like autism awareness training. Um, we do have gender diversity training and we developed that, had a lot of support from Sally Goldner, who was at Transgender Victoria at the time. Um, and Sally really helped us to develop our training package so it's an internal package to scouting. Uh, actually has uh, videos in there from our own young people with lived experience. Um, and um, it's a really exciting package. And um, I'm pretty happy because if the borders stay open in a few weeks, I'm flying to WA to present it in person in Western Australia. Um, so it's uh, pretty lucky, but we delivered it last year over Zoom nationally. Um, we delivered it in Victoria over Zoom. Uh, one of my favorite ones was um, I actually went face to face and traveled up to Mildura and it was only my favorite one because I got to take the train to Swan Hills and then the bus to Mildura. But um, our volunteers are working very, very hard to make sure that they've got the skills and the knowledge and the ability to keep our local scout groups reflecting our local community. We want scouting to be inclusive. There's areas we need to work on. We recognize that, you know, reconciliation um, is definitely an area that scouting can learn and find a pathway to be a real advocate in the community for. Um, so while we're possibly really well established in the LGBTIQA plus space, there's other spaces, cultural diversity, you know, we have some really strong stuff going on, but there's also lots of new Australians who arrived to Australia who wouldn't know what Scouts is, wouldn't know what their local Scout group is, and wouldn't know that they're actually welcome to join Scouting. Um, you know, any young person in our community could join. Um, and so there's work to be done. Um, and it's my pleasure to be a volunteer who's um, supporting that work. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> now, if, if say, uh, well, about a parent is listening to this right now who has a child or a young person themselves who identify as LGBTQI um, plus, what is the best way, how do, should they approach becoming a member? 
of their local scouting group. I think they should just contact their local scout group and uh, go and try it. We have a bit of a thing in scouting where you can try for a couple of weeks without making a uh, commitment. Um, we try and keep scouting as low cost as possible, but um, you know we do realise that people need to try before they buy. Mm -hmm. um, I think just having that chat with your local scout group, whatever your young person's needs are. But I think the other thing we notice in scouting is, you know, our first age group is our Joey Scouts. They start at the age of five when young people are starting to engage with school, start to engage with scouts. Um, and so they're five to seven years of age. Now, young people in that age may not necessarily have that sense of self yet around their sexual or their gender identities. You know, I volunteer actively in the Cub section. They're seven to 11 year olds. Again, I don't think all those kids have necessarily started that process that we, you know, almost every one of us goes through of exploring our identity and exploring what our sexual and gender identities might be, or being comfortable enough to express those inner thoughts that we're having about our identities. So, you know, young people are probably going to be engaged with scouting even before mm -hmm. those conversations and those journeys are happening for them. And that's um, why scouting needs to be inclusive mm -hmm. because we don't want to lose these members. We want to keep them when they're going through those periods of exploration. And that's why we have, you know, the policies we have, the processes we have to be as, ex as flexible and accepting as in and inclusive as we can be. And I think we would just say to any family, always be in communication with your local volunteers and your local volunteers know where they can reach out to for support. Um, and that includes, you know, I travel the state uh, visiting scout groups, um, you know, Zooming with First Reservoir in a, a couple of days time. Monday night I was out with a team of scouts at Fed Square. Like we have practical support for our volunteers. So if our parents ever are in a place of, you know, oh, will my kid be accepted? Just mm. ask because I reckon the answer is yes. That's wonderful. Now, obviously, one but for our audience. So if they, if they, if someone has a child or a relative, say that they're trans and they want to get involved in scouts is there a contact a space or website that people can look at i guess to explore that and then make contact with the scouts um, in victoria or is or anywhere in australia yeah definitely well um you know scouts is very easy to find on your social media and on uh the web and you know typing in the word scouts into google will bring up lots of our websites scoutsvictoria.com.au is obviously our Victorian one and you can put your postcode in there and get the phone number of your local group, get the email for your local group, put in your uh, initial inquiry there. Uh, we have a page on that called All Welcome, which explores, um, I guess, you know, making sure we're communicating with the community um, that we are for young people of all genders. We are for young people um, from all parts of the community. And um, so there is, I guess, the very baseline of information there. Um, but we do have a Facebook group, which is called Scouts Victoria Diversity and Inclusion, or a Facebook page, should I say. Um, and that's where we're, that's really internal communication to our members. You know, currently there's a lot of posts up there uh, communicating about NAIDOC week, obviously. Um, we talk about Reconciliation Week, we talk about Pride March and, um, you know, we're at Purple Day and all those sort of events that our young people might want to put in their local program and how we support them for that. But new parents wanting to explore scouting could easily ask questions of that. But I'd always say, talk to your local team first, because my biggest thing in scouting is local scout groups reflect their local community. Um, and I, you know, live in the town of Trafalgar and I can tell you what happens statewide and I can tell you the policy of Scouts Australia. But I can't give you a local feel for if you, you know, are about to join Fifth Mildura or you're about to join, you know, uh, Second Ararat or whichever, you know, scout group in Victoria you're about to join. I can't tell you what it's like on the ground, but the local volunteers, they're going to show you what their group's like. They're going to introduce you to who their volunteers are and they're going to happily discuss what your needs are, what, you know, your um, how we can include and be supportive. And that's, you know, whether it's disability or cultural. Um, I know, for example, one of our ball and scout groups, one of the things they've done to be culturally supportive is they've realised that 
um, they've got lots of Chinese Australian young people attending their scout group. The kids have perfect English, but the parents don't necessarily. And um, they were sending out all their forms and all their communications without really having a way that the parents could easily translate that. So now they use uh, particular software to send out those communications, which is very compatible with all the mainstream translating uh, things. So now the parents can just quickly use a uh, translating app to uh, completely understand the permission form for the camp. Um, so sometimes it's just those little conversations on a local level uh, that support um, someone to be included in scouts and that's um, I you know I'd always suggest to people talk to your local group and if you get negative answers or you don't get a great response that's when you you know reach out to the state team and we'll make sure that group's supported uh, but what I'd say happens 100% of the time is the local group takes you on and then they reach out to the state team and say hey Wombat can you come visit can you come help or when's the next gender diverse training session for example um, but we'll support groups a lot of the time. Groups will, you know, one of the ones that comes up a lot is our scout halls tended to have been built uh, in, you know, the heyday of community development, the heyday of uh, scouting being uh, very active in the community, and that was the 60s. Well, all accessible toilets or gender neutral facilities, they weren't part of building design in the 60s. And so uh, one of the things I really get is, Know, what strategies can we put in place to you know think about um, supporting our members um, particularly when we've got a member saying to us oh look I prefer to use a gender neutral facility and if we don't have that in our hall we talk about some strategies like uh, maybe there could be a temporary sign uh, that when the young person's going to go use the um, bathroom they put it up that lets everyone else know that for this moment of time that bathroom is going to be all gendered once they're finished the sign down you know there's ways of getting around having a building built in the mm. 50s or the 60s um, or we can just you know hope that we keep getting good grant money and community support like we did at Caroline Springs which if you go in and see our brand new hall at Caroline Springs you go how amazing is this and the diversity of bathrooms there uh, one of my favorite scout halls is the one up in Wodonga which has nine toilets and all of them are individual uh, self-contained units so you don't even need to discuss gender um, that's fantastic building design uh, I really wish we had that in the 60s when we got most of our buildings for scouts but uh, we don't so uh, we work on how can we on a local level uh, be inclusive so that's just one example Wow well well, well well it's been a pleasure speaking with you and I've just gained such a great insight into the voices um, of Scouts and quite clearly it is an exclusive uh, space for young people and people of all ages who may like to volunteer their time. Thank you so much for uh, providing us an insight into your life and to the role of Scouts in Victoria and Australia and worldwide. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me.